Hey everybody, good evening and welcome to 365 Live. So 365 Live is a platform where 365 Cancer Prevention Society educates the public on cancer and encourages a cancer prevention lifestyle. So when you see this logo, you'll know that we are going live on Facebook to share about a cancer related topic. So my name is Dr. Gareth O, and I'm so glad to be here again. I'm going to be your host for tonight's live session. So for tonight, our topic is on head and neck cancers. And you're going to learn lots and lots of amazing things, including risk factors for head and neck cancers, as well as some new treatment options too. Now, of course, this is brought to you specially by 365 Cancer Prevention Society and, of course, our esteemed medical partner OncoCare Cancer Center. So just quickly, if you haven't heard of 365 Cancer Prevention Society, it was founded in 2003 as a social service agency 
and it has an IPC status. So we're a fully fledged member of the NCSS as well. And so the society's mission is to serve the community through holistic cancer prevention measures. Now this is accomplished through lots of different things from health and nutrition education, from promotion of a healthy lifestyle, and of course, doing our, our lymphatic detox exercises. This is our signature program, so check it out if you haven't. Now, we also provide practical and emotional support and care for our members and their family members in their battle against cancer through our residential and hospital visitations, counseling, nutrition consultation, and other wellness services. So please come and like, share, and comment on all of our social media pages and keep up to date with the latest events and activities. Now, before we begin, there's something very important I'd love to share with you. It's a campaign by 365 Cancer Prevention Society. It's called My First Memo. Now, you may know this already, but breast cancer is one of the most common cancers in Singapore. So that's why 365 CPS launched My First Memo to raise funds for women over 40 years old from low income backgrounds to go get a sponsored mammogram screening. And that includes the pre and post consultations. So this screening will allow for early detection of breast cancer and of course, early treatment if required too. So donation tiers start from $10 and go up to 50 and even $100. So if you can, please, please, please take out your mobile phones, yeah? Take a picture of this slide or screenshot it if you're on your phone right now, scan the QR code, please help us by making your first donation. So any amount is gonna be very valuable. You can also key in uh, on the link on the screen if you're unable to scan the QR code, yeah? So I'm just gonna give you a minute just to do this right now and please donate generously because your donation is gonna go a very long way in helping somebody's daughter or somebody's mother and a caregiver that is around you in our community to receive the treatment and the support that they need, yeah? So please do that right now. And of course, I would love to have a special mention to our sponsor, Icon Cancer Center, and our supporting partners, so SATA Com Health and Early Medical Center for making this mammogram screening possible. Alrighty, so please, if you haven't already, do so now, go and donate. Any amount is valuable for all of these people who are gonna receive a life-saving screening, yeah? Okay, so for our session tonight, yeah, one last thing, one last thing, please note, all information that's shared by the speaker, by 365 CPS, is general information, okay? It can be subject to changes, and if you do need personalized or specific detailed medical advice, please consult your doctor, yeah? Alrighty, so tonight, tonight, what are we talking about? Well, this person we've invited, amazing person, he was actually awarded the prestigious Academic Medical Development Award in the UK, by the way, for personalized treatment of lung cancers, and he's also was the clinical lecturer and assistant professor at NUS. He's co-authored multitudes of publications in highly regarded, peer-reviewed international medical journals. And of course, he's actively involved in cutting edge research, including being investigators in global clinical trials. So of course, naturally, naturally, we have invited this person here tonight to speak to you, yeah? So Dr. Tan, are you there? I would love for you to come on stage right now. Hi, Gary. Hi, everyone. Thank you for hey. having me. Dr. Tan, thank you so much for joining us this Saturday evening. Now, I know that there's so much information to get to get through, but you know, I, I understand you're gonna be talking about some risk factors for the head and neck cancers. Yes, definitely. But before I start, do yeah. you know painless ulcer can be an early sign of head and neck cancer as well? Painless ulcers, like mouth ulcers. Mouth ulcers. A lot of oh, people- Oh my. Yeah. Pain is the sign of cancer, but painless ulcer could be a sign of cancer as well. Wow. All right. So this is, that's crazy. Painless ulcers. Okay. So everybody tuning in, if you know anybody with ulcers, please get them to tune in too. Um, where, I'm going to hand over the time to you. I want to learn a little bit more about um, ulcers and, and everything to do with head and neck cancer. So uh, Dr. Tan, let me hand over the time to you. Thank you so much, Gary. 
Okay, thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm going to start uh, my sharing session today. This is mainly made for education and uh, there will be a, a time dedicated for Q&A later. So just bear with me for a short while. I'm going to share my slides uh, right away. All right, this is the title of my talk today, Head and Neck Cancer in 2023. Is this cancer? Should I get this check? So my name is Dr. Tan Chi Singh. I'm the senior medical oncologist currently practicing in Oncocare, Singapore. So this is a topic outline of discussion today, and this is my epidemiology statistics, risk factor, is there a role for screening, some of the signs and symptoms that to look out for, and something of the newer treatment modalities, for example, could there be a less scar tissue for surgery? Proton therapy, some of you might have heard about it, and about immunotherapy. So first off, what are the top 10 causes of death in Singapore? So cancer, unfortunately, is a top cause of death in Singapore, where about 30% of all causes of death are related to cancer. The pneumonia, ischemic heart disease are the distant second and third. The top 10 cancers in Singapore, male versus female, colorectal and lung and prostate are the top three for male. For female, a female breast cancer, colorectal cancer and lung cancer. And in male, nasopharynx, which is a part of a head and neck cancers, are occupying the uh, statistics at number eight. Head and neck cancers overview. Six most common cancers worldwide is been estimated to have around 650,000 cases and about 200,000 deaths per year in the worldwide. In Asia alone, 54,000 new cases are in the US, are but most common cancer in the Central Asia. This is a typical head and neck anatomy. In our very small region in the face, there are all of senses, the smell, the sight, the taste, are all concentrated in this very small space. And these are the vital organs that theoretically, potentially can cause cancer. For head and cancer survival rates, as with any other cancer, the earlier we find out the cancer, the higher the chance of survival in the next five years. For example, in a very early stage, the 83% survival is expected. In the regional spread locally advanced tumor, about 60% survival in the next five years. For patients who have a little bit more distant metastasis, for example, up to 36% can, uh, can be cured in these instances. Usually, some form of radiation, surgery, chemotherapy, and some of the newer options, immunotherapy has been available. Let's share a little bit more about the risk factors. They are typically two different etiology corresponding to the tumor type. Number one, the classic one would be tobacco smoking and alcohol consumption, where are typically lumped under the category of HPV negative. HPV means human papilloma virus. Increasingly, we see more and more infection with high-risk HPV, largely limited to the oropharyngeal or the throat cancer. Increasingly, we find that the patient with a hip and neck cancer related to HPV they are, have a better prognosis, they survive longer, and perhaps may require different types of treatment. Let's move on to the classical uh, type of a hair and neck risk factor, smoking. Smoking is responsible for about 30% of all cancer-related deaths in US, and they are the strongest risk factor for many, many cancers, for example, hair and neck cancers and lung cancer. Smoking damages every part of the body. On the left, the cancers, the typical would be that of head and neck, the lung, stomach, kidney, bladder, and cervical cancer. But more importantly, smoking not only causes lung can uh, cancers, they also cause chronic diseases, for example, stroke, aortic rupture, heart diseases, hardening of the arteries, chronic lung diseases, and asthma. This is a typical content of a, a light up cigarette. Do you have a lighter fluid? You have a sewer gas, you have an arsenic, which is a poison, and you have nicotine, which is an insecticide, actually. 
So theoretically, you are inhaling all types of chemicals that are harmful to your body every time you light up. And unfortunately, tobacco is the most preventable cause of cancer. I do, I do not see any reason why somebody should be smoking except for peer pressure. A typical adult smoker loses an average of 13 years of life due to this addiction. Tobacco acts on the multi parts of the cancer formation. It can also happen in cigar, pipe, smokeless tobacco, e-cigarette, vaping, and secondhand smoking tobacco smokes as well. Increasingly, uh, we, we do see reports of youngsters having a using a vaping of e-cigarettes and some of the heated tobacco. There are some differences involving between the two. For example, heated tobacco uses tobacco and e-cigarette vaping uses a different mechanism to cause the, uh, to vape. FDA came up for patients who uses a e-cigarette or vaping. All tobacco products can lead to nicotine addiction and they do contain the same cancer-causing chemicals and cause serious health problems. This has been water pipe or shika. Shisha has been less popular nowadays, increasingly. Um, but it has been estimated that CDC, one hour session of shisha or hookah is equivalent to smoking 100 cigarettes. And can you imagine the amount of chemicals that you are inhaling in your body for what to be a recreational uh, activity? Moving on from tobacco, next we're talking about alcohol. It is common, it is normal, it is socially acceptable to have a little bit of alcohol on and off and what we call a social drinker. But the threshold can be quite difficult to estimate. For example, a moderate drinker has a two times higher risk of head and neck cancers. For heavy drinkers, up to five times, especially in certain entertainment industry where they do smoke and drink alcohol at the same time. When these two come together, the risk of head and neck cancers are multiplied significantly. So moving away from the classic definition of risk factor for head and neck cancer are these new, uh, newly discovered cause of head and neck cancer or HPV for short, human papilloma viruses. It's a large group of related viruses. They are low risk and high risk subtype. Some are more aggressive compared to the other. And typically, 16 and 18 subtypes are the one more aggressive, has been known to cause cancer in humans. They are typically passed from one person to another through skin-to-skin -skin contact, such as during sexual activity. They are indicated role of HPV vaccination for ladies, for example, in Singapore, between 9 to 24 years old. These are the related cancer that has been associated with HPV. For example, the classic one will be cervical cancer oral cancer, and some of the penile, vulva, anal, and vaginal cancer. For hair and cancer that is related to HPV are typically younger. They are associated with oral sex and also multiple sexual partners. This is how the HPV was being transmitted in the first place, mainly affecting the oral pharyngeal cancer, typically a tonsil, that's where the virus hide and multiply. For some reason, the prognosis are better compared to the conventional uh, patient who smoke or drink. And this is an active area, area of research whether or not, because they do better, generally, can we reduce some of the treatment in terms of the cancer uh, uh, treatment regimen. One other risk factor that is less commonly uh, associated, at least in Singapore, but very common, for example, in Taiwan, would be that of bitter nut chewing. Uh, for those who have seen the bitter nut chewing in the older folks uh, in Singapore before, basically what they chew is a bitter nut together with this leaf and they produces a very red staining uh, fluid which typically is spit it out. And this is a form of uh, social recreational but uh, increasingly it's being faced out in Singapore but it's still very popular in certain part of the world, for example, in Taiwan. And Taiwan has been known to have one of the highest risks of Head and neck cancer because of this uh, recreational activity. Next, now knowing that some of the risk factors can, is there a role for screening? For example, mammogram we discussed earlier for breast cancer. How about head and neck cancers? Based on 
Singapore Cancer Screening Guideline, we do not typically screen for general population because the risk is very, very low and it's not generally recommended. But however, if you have a family members, two or more of head and neck cases, it is important for you to discuss with your doctor, for example, ENT specialist, to talk about screening using a blood test and also a nose scope. What are the typical signs and symptoms related to head and neck cancers? They are generally spike specific, nose, throat, mouth. It is also duration specific. It is very common for us to have mouth ulcer on and off. But what constitutes something that you need to look out for? One of the key two messages to take home today will be that non-healing ulcer ulcer that continue to progress, continue to get worse despite medical treatment. Let's focus a little bit in the mouth. This is a picture of a person who lift up the tongue and this you can see the white patch here, a white or red saw that does not heal on the gum, tongue or any lining, the internal lining of the mouth, you need to be treated carefully mainly because more often than not, they are benign 99% of the time. But if you see this white spot that doesn't go away or it become more and more, it's something that you need to check it out. The other common questions that I do get will be that I do have an ulcer, it's painless, it must not be cancer. That is generally not true. Cancer can present in the early part of the presentation in the painless form before it becomes bigger, wider, and that's when the pain will start to come. But of course, a normal ulcer can look exactly like a cancer ulcer. How do I distinguish? If the ulcer gets worse over time, what kind, how long to wait? Typically, a normal ulcer would heal between a week or two. In my mind, anything more than two weeks, you should get it checked out. Any swelling in the jaw, for example, when you feel that this is a little bit more loop-sided, there's unusual bleeding or pain in the mouth, there's a lump or thickening in the mouth, under the tongue, for example. Or for our loved ones of our elderly uh, cohort, when typically the denture fits for the past 10 years or so, suddenly the denture doesn't fit. It means that something is not quite right. Some anatomy in the mouth has changed. That's why the denture doesn't fit anymore. You do need to check it out. How about throat? You can see a picture here. This is a fairly um, thin lady, but you can see that the somewhat at the lower end of the neck is a little bit more swollen. Okay, this is a thyroid and there is a limb nodes as well so these are some of the symptoms that you need to look out for if the swelling in the throat is big enough it could cause trouble breathing and when you speak you perhaps you need to use more effort and the quality of the spoken voice has changed for example it become more hoarse over time this is something that you need to check it out as well we talk about the lung and the thickening if just behind our wing pipe is our foot pipe, if there's a compression, it's a pressing down towards the wing pipe, it may also press us on the foot pipe. That's when people may have trouble chewing and swallowing food. Okay. You always have the sensation that something is not quite right in the throat, as if there is something that is irritating the throat that doesn't go away. It could be a pain, it could be a sensation. These are something that you, this can be potentially sinister if it causes uh, persist for more than two weeks or so. Voice box, we talk about pain and swallowing. Why ear pain? Our head and neck, the ear, there's a connection between the throat and also the ear. Occasionally, a throat cancer that has caused local swelling may impede on the connection to the ear, causing an ear pain. And the classic causes of voice for patients with a throat cancer is something that we need to be mindful about. 
For patients with the nasal and sinuses, when you have these blocked sinuses that don't clear, or if the GP or family doctors have given you a course of antibiotics, it doesn't quite sort of get rid of the problem. This is something that you need to check it out as well. Bleeding is never normal, all right? Unless you bleed, you dig your nose too hard, but any bleeding through the nose, through the mouth is not normal, okay? For patients with a blocked sinuses, headache is quite a common symptom. And surrounding our eyes are the sinuses. That's why some of the sinus block can cause swelling and pain around the eyes as well. And the maxillary or the cheek sinus can potentially cause pain in the upper teeth because they are connected to each other. And similar to whenever a denture doesn't quite fit when he should have fit for past 10 years or so, you, you ought to check it out as well. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the newer treatment modalities. Not to worry, I'm not going to go to details. I'm just going to share with you some of the newer treatment options available. Less is more. For a while, we know that head and neck cancer treatment can be quite morbid, but uh, increasingly with new technology, new treatment options, we use lesser invasive treatment to produce the same result, okay? One of the key things that has been available in the recent years will be that of a robotic surgery. Basically, head and neck cancers, if the, in a conventional way, there will be a lot of scar tissue. Uh, in selected patients, when the, especially for throat cancer, minimally invasive to remove the head and neck cancer through the mouth, without causing external scar, could potentially be an option. And this is especially useful for patients with HPV or human papillomavirus related head and neck cancer. The typical invasive approach of splitting the jaw, the throat is no longer the classic approach. And this results in a shorter healing time and lesser side effects for patients who are eligible for this robotic surgery. This is a typical setup for patient undergoing a robotic transoral robotic surgery, where patient will be seated or uh, will be lying down on this operating room. And these are the setup of the robotic arms. The, the surgeons are actually at a different console away from the operating uh, table. So literally next to it. So what these surgeon do is they're able to see the very camera directly go into the very tight space in the mouth in a 3D form. And they use a very smart tool to navigate uh, using these three or four arms, using a two fingers or three fingers, and do a lot of uh, cutting uh, and also suturing and to achieve a much better result because all this in a very magnified view. And the recovery times are much better for most of the patients who are suitable for this form of treatment. Proton therapy. So some of you might have heard the word proton therapy. It is going to be launched in Singapore in the next couple of months. I'm very excited for, uh, for patients who will be eligible for proton therapy. It's a type of external beam radiotherapy. It's suitable for a number of patients with certain cancer type and head and neck will be one of them, fortunately. It reduces the risk of long-term side effects that has been developed with Standard chemo radiotherapy, proton therapy reduces the risk. I'm going to explain to you a little bit more later using a diagram. Okay, it's especially useful for patients with cancer that are close to important parts of the body. For example, our head and neck, because it's literally next to the eyeball, next to the brain, next to the spinal cord, and we try to minimize unnecessary damage through the conventional radiotherapy. What will proton therapy do in a standard radiotherapy? It's like a laser. You just imagine like a laser. If the, there's a tumor, for example, in this part of the brain, when we shoot a laser to read, it's true and true. But what proton therapy do is that it shoot through the tumor and there are no any further radiation leak behind the trail. That reduces significantly damage to the tissue surrounding and behind the tumor cell only focusing on the tumor. 
Because of that, uh, increasingly it's been used by a lot of a tumor type and head and neck will be one of the typical cases that we will consider favorably. How about immunotherapy? In the normal immune system, our immune cells or T cells here always recognizes a cancer cell and will recognize it, you will seek for it and you kill it. But cancers are very clever. What they do is produces this PDL1 molecule. You just imagine, uh, my apology for all the Harry Potter fans in the, uh, in the tonight. Just imagine Harry Potter as a cancer cell. What they do is put it putting on an invisibly cloak to mask themselves from Ron, which is the immune system. When the immune system can't recognize the cancer cell, it can't attack. It can't destroy the cancer cell. And that is why it allows the cancer cell to grow bigger and start to spread to other body parts. What immunotherapy does is to take away this invisibly cloak from the cancer cell, allowing the immune system to recognize it and to kill it. In fact, the discovery of immunotherapy has won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2018 by these two American and Japanese scientists. I'm glad to inform that FDA Singapore HSA has approved two immunotherapies since 2016 and 2019 respectively for use for head and neck cancers in Singapore and is routinely used for selected patients. With that, I end my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you so much for your comprehensive and, of course, very informative uh, content as well. And those pictures, especially at the end, I, I quite liked this idea of this kind of robotic surgery um, where everything's magnified. Um, and also the, the proton therapy, because I actually have a, a patient of mine who has undergone some radiation surgery and has had brain damage uh, or other parts of the brain damage as a result as well. So I'm glad that these can also be targeted. So thank you once again, uh, yeah, for sharing. Now I'm gonna turn it over to questions. If there are any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Tan, please do share it in the chat. Um, I just have one very quick question here first uh, that's come in, it says, should I, go for a scan if I have prolonged headaches or painful neck lymph nodes? And if I do, what scans should I go for? Hmm. I think that's a common question, common symptom that uh, some of our patients do uh, encounter. Um, I think usually a patient would need to see a doctor first. The doctor will assess some of the, any other associated signs and symptoms. Um, headache can be a bit tricky because it can be as simple as a headache from a stress, work, or migraine related, but anything more sinister generally requires a form of a MRI scan. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. It's a form of a big magnet looking directly into the brain cavity and uh, looking for any possible causes of the uh, headache. Anything that is swollen in the neck is typically very suspicious. And generally, a form of MRI of the nose, mouth, and neck will be required to elucidate, to find out what is the cause of the swelling in the neck. Mm, okay, thank you so much. So um, we have a, another question. And uh, the question says, after radiation therapy, I still experience some neck pain. Is that normal? Hmm. So typically radiation uh, causes a few things. Typically we are talking about the acute phase, the medium term and the long term. So it depends on which part, if which phase we are talking about, a head, a neck or jaw stiffness can be one of the science effects. Typically in the acute phase, there's still a real raw wound around it, a raw inflammation around the mouth and the neck. And typically, this should settle down within a month or two. And the doctor, the radiation doctors may give you some form of exercise 
to reduce in the medium to long-term side effects related to radiation where a stiffness of the neck or stiffness of the jaw could be a problem in the long run. So for example, opening up jaw, exercises, turning the head left and right. So these are the, some of the uh, things that we can advise our patient to do to reduce the long-term debilitating side effects of the radiation. Mm. Okay, and, uh, and, and a follow-up question is, um, is it recommended uh, to do some TCM treatment concurrently with the uh, oral chemo? Mm. So it depends on the individual uh, oncologists who are prescribing the medication. For my personal belief, I'm not against uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and I strongly encourage for those who believe in the traditional medicine to do it before we start the treatment or after we start the treatment so as not to interfere with the some of the uh, treatment. Because, for example, I do prescribe a lot of uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and they are tailored according to the patient's size, height, and weight. Um, any interaction from external sources, for example, traditional medicine, be it Chinese, Malay, or Indian, uh, may interfere with the dosing. Uh, you may get unnecessary high side effects on a chemo, or worse, it may interact such that the level of the medication is uh, too low and you're not getting any benefit from the chemotherapy. So my general advice is to do it before we start any treatment and to after so that it not cause any interaction, un un unintended interaction between the two. Uh, fairly, I would say fairly different discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, may I, uh, another question. So may I know, what are your views on a swollen lymph node in the neck that has been around for more than a year? So mm -hmm. they did uh, a bit of information. They did have a previous ultrasound uh, and that came back inconclusive. And so they were sort of told to wait and see. Uh, but they are a little worried because, well, it's been around for more than a year. So any uh, maybe tips or insights? Yeah. I, I do not like any swelling in the neck. So our neck is a, a very tight uh, expressway for many uh, body parts. Can be for lymph nodes, can be for thyroid, can be for a tissue from the floor of the mouth that goes down. Uh, generally, ultrasound will be very useful. If ultrasound is not clear in terms of the cause of the swelling, um, I would as a first question to consider uh, using a magnetic resonant MRI scan to have a quick deeper, better resolution of the problem. And I'll probably get my ENT colleague to come on board as well. Probably this requires a multidisciplinary team where some form of biopsy, they are as basic as a needle biopsy, but if we can't get a conclusive answer to it, generally a small nick to take out some tissue for a better view under the microscope by the pathologist to determine is it a malignant or is it a benign and we'll treat accordingly mm, okay yes and yes mris are definitely a great way to visualize yeah internally yeah higher higher so, resolution for sure high resolution exactly and we can kind of see everything so on ultrasound sometimes we only see the part that's been scanned but we don't we don't see the, the whole neck Beyond right the whole brain. Yeah. yeah exactly so um just a follow-up question about more scans yeah uh usually people don't go for brain scans and, and you know, don't necessarily just go for an MRI screening. So what can we do to protect against or lower our risk of you know, brain cancer or, or these head and neck cancers? Mm. So one of the key uh, risks of reducing head and neck cancers or brain cancers are to reduce some of the risk factors as mentioned earlier. So for example, if you have your loved one is a current smoker, or heavy drinker, and one of the key steps is to reduce exposure to these harmful substances and material uh, because in the long run, they damage the lining of the mouth, nose, and causes cancer in the long run. So number one, reduce the risk factor. Number two, we talk about the second risk factor, which is uh, afflicting the younger population. We talk about HPV infection. Uh, we're talking about patients who have uh, multiple sexual partners, um, oral sex. So these are some of the risk factors that if we can avoid, uh, that will be ideal. But I, I think we will, should never interfere with somebody's uh, personal life in that regard. But whenever possible, 
uh, we talk about HPV vaccination for younger uh, in Singapore, we advocate HPV vaccination for young girls between 9 to 24 years old, especially when they are not sexually active yet. Uh, this will reduce the chance of uh, getting a HPV infection that may eventually lead to other types of cancer in head and neck and cervical cancer for ladies. Mm, okay, and sorry, just a, a quick follow up as well. I know that um, you mentioned about the risk factors and I was quite shocked with the, the shisha uh, you said like an hour of smoking, the, the shisha was like the equivalent of a hundred, was it cigarettes or something? Absolutely. By the yeah, that's crazy. What, what was it? What was the data for the vaping again? That, because vaping is also quite common now um, in certain populations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is that similar? So they, they work a little bit differently. Um, vaping is obviously in the other trend. If you read the newspapers, um, it is illegal in Singapore, by the way. Um, but there are regional countries, Malaysia, Thailand, so I think it's an open kind of situation where uh, vaping is very common. But what vaping does, which um, I think there are some misinformation that was uh, handed out by certain um, vaping uh, groups, would be that it's uh, less harmful. But unfortunately, the data, the science uh, would not suggest so. Uh, what it does is also exposing a patient to a certain type of harmful, very similar to smoking, that's number one. Number two, what the vaping does, it has this uh, heat and burn method that causes a lot of uh, uh, unintended uh, chemical reaction using the fluid. And uh, when the, the manufacturer of the vaping is not in, uh, not very clear about how to make it, what happens in the earlier part, uh, a couple of years ago, there's a lot of lung injury related to vaping in the reported in the US. And there were a case a two where a young chap was required a lung transplant because the lung was so badly injured by the heat and burn method by the vaping. So I, I would caution um, uh, very seriously yeah. for young, young uh, audience here to, to not to pick up vaping because I think he has different kind of problems associated with it. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warning and to everybody listening, please uh, take Dr. Tan's advice. I do have a follow up question um, from somebody who asked earlier about the TCM treatment with the uh, that was you know concurrently with some oral chemo. So they, they have mentioned again that they are currently on the oral chemo um, and they're getting some side effects on their skin. Uh, cracking lips, and they've looked uh, and consulted a dermatologist, but it doesn't seem to help. So again, any input on what they could do? Mm. So um, chemotherapy itself can cause some side effects, uh, as mentioned. It does cause a drying of the skin. Uh, depending on the type of chemotherapy, it can cause ulcer as well. Um, I, I always tell my patient, chemotherapy uh, is like a heaty Chinese medicine where it causes a lot of uh, problem uh, similar to what we experienced it. Some Chinese medicine is also quite well known to be heaty in that regards. Uh, generally, when your heat and heaty, heaty comes together, it will just make the whole situation worse. Um, I would generally uh, discourage uh, mixing together at the same time. Uh, and I would try to space out between, let's say uh, a patient really quite keen to try the traditional medicine. And I would prefer them to to space it up rather than concurrently to reduce some of the side effects that we I, I some of our patients do encounter uh with uh, when they combine it together unfortunately okay but do you, do you happen to have a quick fix on like a you know how they could try to get through this cracked lips or these uh, dry skin have you had any um clients any patients with uh this issue that they've been able to sort of overcome yeah a simple topical um applications for example a vaseline uh, would be very useful to moisturize the area to prevent the crack from getting worse. And uh, some of my patients uh, do find an uh, oral cord E, which is an active ingredient triamnisolone, uh, can be available through any guardian or any pharmacy, uh, but must buy through uh, the pharmacies or even a prescription from a local GP. Uh, that will reduce the inflammation and it does speed up the recovery of the cracked lips ulcer uh, quite expeditiously. And lastly, to fight heating medicine, you just need to get cooling medicine. So I always advise my patient, drink more water, 
get coconut drinks. Uh, th those are very helpful as well, uh, just to sort of cool down the system a little bit. Yeah. Mm, that's that's great. Yeah, definitely. Drink lots and lots of water. Uh, coconut water is great as well. Like you said, the, the cheap version is the Vaseline. But yes, if you need something a little bit more potent, do go and look um, and seek some uh, that prescription from your GP as well. Yeah. Okay, another question coming through now. Uh, may I know what is your personal view, Dr. Tan, on mobile phone usage in terms of uh, being a risk factor? Uh, and of course, then of course, you know, the earphones, I mean, I'm wearing one <laughs> right here. So, you know, earphones, headphones, um, you know, is, is that, is this good or is that a good substitute for maybe holding a, a phone close to my ear, um, especially for people who are on their phone, you know, multiple hours during the day? Ah, this is a very common question. Fortunately, there's a big database to answer this question. For the longest time, people worry that radiation from a phone, putting close to your ear, brain, brain cancer, putting in a pocket, causing, you know, the cancer at that part of the Yeah, body. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> fortunately, what's the, what's the research say? Fortunately, it has been debunked. So, Oof. phone usage does not cause okay additional brain cancer or any form of cancer in the pocket okay. area. I'm but, so glad to know. And mainly because the radiation that's emitted by our latest generation of phones are so little, it's no, no worse than flying, for example. Mm, so in fact, okay. you get more radiation from flying rather than a phone that's stuck to your, to your ears. Yeah, so, do you know I, I heard a long I heard a long time ago about for males mobile phone in the front pocket close to the the, the reproductive organs lower <laughs> sperm counts is there any truth to that I'm just kind of no, curious now that... no, fortunately no okay. <laughs> okay cool good 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 I'm glad uh, but I do have kids already but I'm glad still <laughs> all right another questions come through uh, Dr Tan thank you for the questions by the way please. If this has been valuable, please ask more questions. If you'd like to, uh, please um, send your, your 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 thanks or any other concerns that you might have in the chat too, just so that we can get some feedback here. Uh, we have another question here, Dr. Tan, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yep, so should a benign mass in the neck be removed or it doesn't matter if it doesn't affect the quality of life? Okay. I generally do not like any lump swelling in the neck. That has been my standard answer. But it has, if it has been proven to be benign, um, generally I would advise there's no need to remove it unless you want to remove it for aesthetic reason. Mm, okay. Because there is, is there, I mean, you, you talked about sort of more minimally invasive surgeries like that robotic surgery, but if somebody did have a big lump, um, I mean, removing that, surgically would you know if it was let's say obvious and for aesthetic reasons i mean there would be potentially um you know some healing uh, a lot of healing required right and and outcomes Definitely. might not be so good if scar tissues mm. uh, you're replacing yeah. one aesthetic problem with another that's one thing yeah uh, i i have seen patients with a very large uh, goiter or a large thyroid swelling that is benign um, even though they are benign uh, occasionally what it does to compress or presses on the local structure, it may impede on the voice, it may cause local swelling, it doesn't allow you to swallow very well. So it causes symptoms, even though it may be benign, it may be a reason to get it sorted out, get it removed as well. So yeah. not yeah. all so benign requires is... but if it does cause symptoms, you should consider getting rid of it. Yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I, I think that's a, such good advice because yes, if it, if it does affect, I mean, your quality of life or ability to swallow or breathe, that's affected, then yes, please do go and get that checked out. Yeah. All right. So right now, Dr. Tan, I don't see any more questions coming through. So with that, I would like to thank you very, very much for your time uh, and answering all these questions. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Do you have no. time for just one more question? Yeah. I just uh, I saw one sneak in just before I'm about to close it all up. No answer, no problem. <laughs> all right, so so maybe the lucky last question, unless someone wants to sneak in a question right now as I'm saying this one, yeah. So type as fast as you can, and I'll talk as slow as I can as well. All right, so this question here, uh, Dr. Tan, could you share 
uh, maybe what are your views on any dietary adjustments for current cancer patients? Mm. So I think there's a lot of uh, questions, a lot of research uh, coming through. Um, generally, if you're taking a specific uh, medications, uh, for example, some patients are taking oral targeted therapy, it may interact with certain uh, food. For example, a, a classic case would be a pomegranate, uh, star fruit, pomelo, so, but these are very pertinent to a very specific uh, oral targeted therapy, for example. By and large, uh, the diet for patients on chemotherapy, for example, um, the requirement from us medical oncologists are very simple. No raw food, mainly because raw food has higher bacterial load that is still alive. As long as it's cooked properly, it's made fresh, generally, uh, they are good for consumption. Chemotherapy does reduce your risk, does reduce your immune system, and as such, you are at higher risk of catching an infection. And that is why raw food is a no-no for cancer uh, for chemotherapy patients. Mm, yeah, thank you. And by the way, for everybody listening and, and is interested in uh, more about nutrition, 365 CPS, we do have an in-house nutritionist. Um, they do a lot of presentations from time to time. So they do specifically talk about nutrition for those with cancer. So please reach out um, to us if you would like more advice or just stay tuned because there's always programs like this where you can learn about nutrition as well. So speaking of nutrition, there was one last question that did sneak in. Well done. Congratulations. Um, I think this is about cooling foods, I, I think, because radish, I think, is a cooling fluid, yeah? Can we eat radish during this, uh, during the chemos? Perfectly fine, as long as cooked properly, not in a raw yeah. form. Um, I, I mentioned that chemotherapy are typically in the Chinese um, medicine uh, era, they, they were called hiti. Uh, some form of a balance it with uh, some cooling uh, uh, food would be ideal, and uh, it does reduce some of the side effects of the chemotherapy. Great. So radish it up, eat it up, relish it, relish the radish. Okay. Thank you very much for those questions. And uh, Dr. Tan, thank you once again for answering the additional questions too. And of course, for your insightful sharing this evening. Yeah. So I will invite you to take your leave, but thanks once again. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you everyone for the enjoyable evening. All right. Good night. Alrighty, so we're about to wrap up, but please, please, please do not go anywhere yet. Yeah, at this point, I would love your feedback. So your feedback, chuck it in the comments right now or check out this QR code that you're going to see on your screen. Do scan it. We do want your feedback. And of course, the reason why we want feedback is we want to deliver what you like to hear. We want to help you benefit from all of our sessions. So please, I would urge you to just spend 30 seconds, give us your feedback and, uh, and we will do our very best to help you help your friends to acquire the information, the knowledge that you're seeking. Okay. So have a look at this. You can also check the comments. The link is in the comment for the feedback. So you can click that link too. And I want to introduce our next Facebook live session. It's going to be on the 20th of May and it's going to be about reducing high blood pressure through our diet. So again, we do have an in-house dietitian, nutritionist, Jingwen, and she's going to be sharing with you about the DASH diet. So in other words, if you know somebody, whether you have cancer or don't have cancer and you have high blood pressure and you want to reduce it, you guys need to come along. 20th of May, right here, same place, same time, 8.30 p.m. And you can adopt this to improve your blood pressure. So thank you once again, everybody, for tuning in today. Please do like share and follow us on all of our social media pages to keep up to date with all of our latest events and don't forget my first memo if you haven't already please donate donate generously Alrighty, so dr gary though here it's a pleasure being your host for this evening i hope to see you guys in the next session until then take care stay safe and have a wonderful long weekend